All right, I think we can start. So uh, welcome uh, everyone to this uh, seminar, uh, an optimal seminar series uh, devoted to uh, energy optimization and learning. Today, it's our pleasure to host uh, Lian Han, a postdoctorate researcher from the Technical University of Denmark. He's a part of Energy Analytics and Markets uh, Group. Uh, his current research is focused on economics of data and its applications to uh, energy systems. And prior to joining uh, uh, DTU, he received his PhD from the University of Oxford with a thesis focusing on the applications of cooperative game theory um, to prosumer-centric uh, energy markets. And uh, he expands his research interest towards uh, data markets, uh, to broad applications of data markets with metrics to measure feasibility and fairness of such uh, markets. Um, please feel free to drop your uh, questions um, into chat or unmute yourself as we go. So uh, Lian expressed his wish to make uh, this um, seminar as interactive as possible. Um, all right, now, Lian, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Vladimir, for the introduction. Um, so I guess I will share my screen now, right? Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Very well. Great. Um, yeah, thanks again for the invitation um, to give today's talk. And uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I think some of you might have also participated in Inform. So thanks for staying a little bit longer uh, in this long week um, for this talk. Um, and like Vladimir just said, I would like to make it uh, as interactive as possible. So please feel free to interrupt me anytime during the talk. And if you post questions in the comment box, uh, Vladimir will also catch those and um, uh, let me know. Cool. So like uh, Vladimir said, I'm currently a postdoc at the Technical University of Denmark, and I work primarily with um, Pierre Pinson and Jalal Kassenpour um, on the topics of data markets um, and their applications. And this presentation will include content from these two papers that we actually just finished this month. Um, they were both on archive. Um, so if you have questions and you, um, of course you can ask me or you can refer to these papers um, after the presentation. Um, and I also would like to acknowledge, acknowledge the collaboration with uh, Ricardo and Carla at Inesc Tech in uh, Portugal. And also uh, I've received some really helpful tips from Amandine on uh, time series data, uh, who is a PhD student in our group. Um, and this work is carried out under the smart for s project, which is a European Union Horizon 2020 project. Um, and we have received many useful um, uh, collaboration opportunities from these six uh, countries, or oh, I mean, uh, the, uh, these partners are from uh, the six different countries in Europe. Um, so without their help, um, the work that I'm going to present today would not have been possible. Let's start with some outline of the presentation. I'm going to start uh, with some motivation on why we need data markets. Then I'm gonna talk about a very generic data market um, framework and introduce the market players. Um, and then uh, I will talk about the regression framework that we have uh, incorporated under the data market and how uh, that is relevant. And finally, I will introduce this concept of using a lasso uh, regression and the lasso term as the payment allocation within this data market framework. And then I will talk about some case studies and the results before concluding and uh, some discussion on the ongoing research. First off, um, what motivated us to talk about data markets? Why do we need it? I think most of the audience members here have some sort of uh, experience with energy markets. So let's start with an example there. Um, so for example, we have some renewable agents in the wholesale energy wholesale market. 
uh, for, for example, a wind agent, they do some sort of forecasting using their own data, historical data or weather measurements. Uh, and they bid into the wholesale market. And based on that bid, the energy wholesale market clears it and um, give, gives them some uh, contracted payment. In real time, they deliver the energy, which is gonna be different from what they bid. And that might incur an imbalance cost. And this imbalance cost can be in many different forms depending on the market you're in, um, but it's quite universal. Um, and obviously you have different players in this market. You have, might have other wind agents at the same time doing the same things. Um, and we have discovered also based on uh, existing literature that there is an opportunity for them to share their data so that they can mutually improve their forecast. Um, and the, an improved forecast also means uh, a lower imbalance between their bid and their real-time delivery and hence a lower imbalance cost. So there is this possibility for them to share data, but the problem here is that they are also competitors. So there is also a lack of incentive for them to do that because they're essentially, by doing that, they will essentially be helping their com competitor out. And what if we have a data market which would allow um, or incentivize this type of data exchange or data disclosure um, so that they can actually do this without worrying about this loss of competitiveness uh, in a market. So that's one of the motivations uh, behind our work. And if we're looking at another example that are kind of a more day-to-day -day experience of ourselves, um, I think most of us are on social media. Um, these platforms like Facebook, um, I guess they'll be meta very soon. So they collect data from uh, us, personal data, and then they target us with specific advertisements that they think uh, will be the, of the most interest to us. And then some of us would be like, oh, that's an interesting product. And then I will probably, I will go and buy it that I might never use. Um, and then we pay money to these brands and buy them at the same time. These brands also pay these social platforms um, some advertising fees. And if you look at this loop, you will notice that, wait a minute, what about our data? Is it just freely offered? Wh which it is uh, nowadays. Um, um, is that fair? Some people may say, okay, actually we do get a little bit of benefit because now we get more targeted information which might be more relevant to us. But I think that is kind of a similar argument than um, uh, uh, compared to free internships or unpaid internships. Um, it's to me, that's just kind of, uh, yeah, of course you get experience, but it's also exploitation of free labor. Um, so here is another motivation for us to think, what if there is a data market in place where the companies have to ask you whether you would like to share your data um, for a certain financial compensation. Um, I guess in Europe, now we have GDPR where it asks people to decide whether they would like to share the data or not on these platforms, but obviously there's still some data that is being collected constantly. You cannot avoid that. And at the same time, um, sometimes it's inefficient to have this setup where people just have a binary choice of whether sharing the, their data or not um, without giving the option of, okay, maybe I can be compensated a little bit and share, but if without compensation, then I won't share. Um, so that is another motivation behind having the state of market. Could I just ask you a quick question? Yes, of course. So, yeah. So uh, one thing though, is that one argument that a lot of these tech companies have produced is that uh, you are, it, it, the, the, the payback is not in the service of recommendation that you're getting, but rather the free service that you're getting, for example, in, in, in a free search in Google. So you mm -hmm. can you can use search and and so the question is would you be willing to pay for search and then we pay for your data uh, so the the real uh, kind of um, <laughs> sort of uh, benchmarking is not so much in the recommendation but the service that in which they collected the data so the question is you know have you thought about that aspect of the argument yeah I guess that is an interesting argument um, I mean I, I think without getting into the nitty gritty of of that, I think 
of course, uh, you can say I'm getting uh, your free data to offer you a service, but how do you quantify the value of my service to you at the same time? It's, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, and like going back to my argument about the uh, unpaid internship, like I'm offering this opportunity for you to intern with us um, so you can get the experience or you can get some you know, lines on your CVs. That is also a service that we're providing to you, but then at the same time, I'm getting your free labor. Is that fair? I think some people might not think so. So yeah, that's, uh, but I guess there's a, a lot of arguments that can go behind that. All right, so let's uh, move on to uh, the next section, uh, which is a generic data market. Um, and I'm in this uh, part, I'm just gonna go, uh, go over kind of the key components and um, of a basic setup of a data market. Here we have two types of players where um, there's a data buyer or multiple data buyers and data sellers. Some important monetary values uh, include the seller's cost of selling data, or um, here I will later introduce this concept of uh, conservation, uh, reservation uh, to sell data, and also the uh, buyer's profit from a certain analytics task, and of, of course the data payment from the buyer to the seller. Uh, I'm going to use a very simple illustration to demonstrate that. Here we have a buyer with some own data uh, represented by D. And from that data, the buyer can make a certain profit F of D. Now here comes a seller with some additional data, Delta D. By disclosing that, the buyer is able to make some additional profit with the, with the additional data, Delta F. So now there's an increase of profit for the buyer uh, note that I'm using kind of D plus delta D here as in a volumetric form, but it doesn't have to be. The data can be completely different types of features, um, but this is just for um, the ease of notation. Um, and then the seller at the same time may suffer a cost that might be associated with their privacy or just the, the cost of providing the data or a lack of, or, or a reduction or a lack of competitiveness, um, like we mentioned earlier in the wind case um, uh, or what have you. And this is kind of where we are at the moment. Sometimes when you, when you just share the data freely with the, with the buyer, but with the existence of a data market, you might be able to say, okay, the buyer now can take a chunk of their additional profit and allocate that to the seller. Of course, if the payment is a little too low and it doesn't even cover this cost of the buyer, sorry, the, the seller, um, the seller has the option to reject that payment. And now, and that's that, then, then there will be no data shared. Um, so there is a sweet spot or a range of payment that will satisfy the individual rationality for both the buyer and the seller, where the, uh, the payment is lower than the additional profit for the buyer and but at the same time higher than the cost of the seller. In that case, both players are happy and um, we have a uh, successful trade you know, of data. So that is just the data market in a nutshell. Um, and the next thing we're gonna look at is what is this analytics task of the buyer? And we define it um, as a regression framework plus a um, kind of forecasting uh, exercise. So now uh, we're gonna talk about, uh, I'm going to talk about the data market under regression framework. Um, and here is another diagram showing the basic setup of it. Um, first, let's look at the main players. First, on the left-hand side, there's the buyer. On the right-hand side, there's the seller. And in the middle, there's a central market operator. Um, I'm going to discuss every box in detail, but before that, let's look at the, the index, the, the indexes. So for the buyer, they're gathered in a set B, uh, indexed by I, and for the sellers, they're gathered in set S uh, with the index J. Uh, first, let's look at the market inputs. Um, on the buyer side, the buyer has this analytics task in a form of a linear regression with an eventual forecasting job. 
Um, and in the wind case, they would just use their own historical data to forecast their uh, real-time generation. So um, they have their own data, they have their forecasting target, um, and they do some sort of regression to find the regression coefficients. Um, and here we also define this phi number as the willingness to pay, which will come in handy later um, uh, in our uh, data market. So we're using only in-sample analyses and we assume that the buyer uh, uses, the, uses the MSC to measure their losses, which is the mean square error uh, in their forecast, uh, which is a, um, and the loss function would be the product of this willingness to pay and their um, MSC. Um, so that kind of represents what, how, how much the, the, the buyer is willing to pay for an improvement of um, the, the losses. And naturally, if they wanna minimize this term, they would use the ordinary least squares regression for their analytics task. So they do the regression first in the first step and then they calculate their losses and they, they broadcast that to the central data market operator. From the seller's perspective, the seller has data, um, including their actual data and also uh, this value called reservation to sell each feature. And additionally, they have a certain revenue threshold that is a function of um, both their own data and also the correlation between their data and the buyer's forecasting target, which makes sense because if my data is more valuable to um, say this data buyer, I would probably want to get a higher cut of their profit. So, um, so it is also a function of the correlation between uh, our data. Um, and let's just assume that the seller has this simple revenue threshold uh, as a function um, listed like this. It's just the product, it's a it's L1 norm of the product of um, their reservation to sell and the coefficient um, uh, between their, their data and the, the buyer's data. Um, any questions? I think should be straightforward so far. No, oh, okay. Um, and then once the central market operator has gone all that information, they um, do their job. Now, first they need to update the regression with the additional data they have received from the data seller. Um, and then they would uh, also update the losses of the buyer based on the, the, the updated regression. Um, and since the, the loss function is chosen by the buyer to use the MSC, um, the data market operator cannot change that. So they would continue to use the, the, this MSC times the willingness to sell as loss function. Um, and here we denote this um, XS as the, the kind of the, comp, the uh, matrix that includes uh, both the, uh, the buyer's data and also the seller's data. And if we want to minimize this new loss function, um, the data market operator may choose to, again, use the OLS regression, um, but it, they don't have to. In this case, they can alternatively use other regression methods uh, or uh, regression with uh, different regularization. Um, for example, they can use the lasso as the uh, regularizer. Um, the lasso stands for the least absolute strain cajun selection operator, which is just an L1 norm um, of the coefficient matrix times a constant lambda here. And you might think this looks familiar, um, which is um, which is correct, and I will introduce kind of the core, the, the relationship between this and the uh, threshold um, revenue threshold that was set by the sellers before later. But um, just so now, uh, now just so you know that the um, central market operator can choose whatever regression they would like to use within the market frame, framework. And then after that, the central market operator would uh, calculate the difference between the losses before and after the trading of data and set the upper bound of the payment for the buyer 
um, so that the, it makes sense for the buyer to participate in the data market. And then they would have to decide the revenue for the sellers. Um, here, there is a way, there are many ways to de define how this revenue is calculated. But if we assume that the market operator would first collect the payment from the buyer and then allocate that payment, um, in a paper we have, wrote, uh, we have written together, uh, we defined different ways. The uh, first one is the leave one out allocation policy, which is similar to the VCG, um, it, uh, the Victoria Clark Groves allocation, which um, defines the payment based on the marginal contribution of each um, seller's data to the buyer and then use, uses that directly as the payment. Unfortunately, this violates the revenue adequacy or the uh, budget balance um, property, meaning that when you collect the payment from the buyer, that might not be enough to cover all the revenues that you have to allocate to the sellers. Uh, an alternative way of allocating the payment is to use the Shapley value, which is a concept um, out of cooperative game theory, and it satisfies certain fairness properties like the zero element, which means that if you, as a seller, provides data that has not has no value uh, for the buyer, then you will get zero payment. Uh, and symmetry, meaning that uh, if two sellers have data that would contribute equally to the buyer's um, reduction of the loss function, then they will get paid equally. So there are different ways to do this allocation, but regardless of the ways you do the allocation, if as long as you're doing it post regression, you do not have a way to guarantee that each allocation um, can make sure that the, the revenue you allocate to the sellers can be um, at least um, at the revenue threshold for the sellers. So the sellers can actually reject that payment uh, if the revenue is actually below their revenue threshold. And in that case, you would have to go back to the central market operator and say, okay, I'm not gonna, uh, give you my data anymore. So they have to redo the market clearing uh, without your data. And because everybody's data might be correlated and by taking one seller's data out, um, you, might have, you might have an impact on other seller's value to the, to the whole uh, regression. So it quickly becomes a combinatorial problem for the data market operator um, that gets really hard to solve when you increase the number of sellers. So this leads to our framework to think of this payment allocation um, or to loop this payment allocation directly in this regression framework uh, from uh, the, our market operator's perspective um, by using the lasso. So let's first look, think about the objective of the data market uh, operator, uh, which is naturally to maximize the data market's Oh, sorry, the data buyers gain while meeting all the data sellers revenue requirements. And again, recall that the loss function is a, the product of the willingness to sell from the buyer's perspective and the set kind of loss function that they would like to use, the, which is the MSC in this case. Um, and um, obviously here, it, all the subscript with, with S meaning uh, means that uh, the data now is a collection of both the buyer's data and the seller's data. And the coefficients are corresponding to those as well. And uh, for a buyer in this data market, their gain is not just the difference between uh, their loss before the disclosure of data and the uh, and the their their loss after the, the the disclosure of the data, you have to also consider the payment the buyer has to pay to the buyer uh, to, the, to the sellers. So um, the loss or the new updated loss function for the buyer would be the sum of their own loss function from the forecasting task and their payments. Um, so in order to maximize this you would have to maximize the, this whole equation. And remember that LI um, is a value that the buyer calculates for themselves by using their own data. 
So it's a, it is a fixed number um, and the data market operator has nothing to do with this. So, um, and if we make certain assumptions here, let first let's assume that the, uh, we have a balanced budget um, market. So that means the payment from the buyer would be the sum of the revenue from, for the sellers. And um, since the seller has a certain revenue requirement, which is CJ, they require the final revenue uh, to be higher than that. Let's just set them to be uh, equal. And um, recall our earlier assumption about the revenue requirement from the seller's perspective. It's a, the L1 norm of the product of uh, their reservation to sell and their corresponding uh, coefficients from the regression task. We can rewrite this payment um, using pretty much the L1 norm of everybody's reservation to sell and their coefficients um, in the new regression. And um, here we need to note that the, the new set of lambda values has to be, um, well, it has to include also the, the, the lambda value for, for the, the buyer and that has to be set to zero because otherwise you will have you you will shrink the the coefficients for the buyer's own data as well. Um, let me go back here. Is there any questions now? I think maybe lasso um, regression is a new concept for some of you. No. Okay. Um, so now we would like to see what the new regression would look like. So now maximizing the gain of the buyer becomes to find the beta because now the, the payment has become also a, a function of beta. So now to maximize the gain, it has, it has become a, a task to find the beta that would minimize the second the, the thing in the in a bracket. Um, so that include that's the sum of the loss function of the buyer with everybody's data and also the payments of the buyer. Um, and we rewrite this um, with the expanded version uh, where the loss function is a function of the MSC of the forecast and then the, the payment is um, the L1 norm. And this looks very similar to a lateral regression. The only difference is that in a traditional lateral regression, you would have a uniform lambda value outside of this L1 norm. Um, but in terms of computation, this doesn't really add any computational complexity to uh, the lateral regression. So, and the benefit of using this last regression to replace the original um, uh, regression task of the market operator is that this lasso term directly represents the payment. So you don't have to allocate the payment again after the regression. So going back to this diagram, we see what's been updated here is this box where originally the central market operator is was just going to uh, update the regression coefficients. But here, if we're using a last regression directly by incorporating the revenue requirements from the sellers, um, you would eventually get a, a, the beta values that would maximize the buyer's overall gain and at the same time meeting all the requirements of the sellers. And so naturally the sellers, when they would receive their uh, payments, they would it will meet their requirements so they would never have to go back to the central market operator and reject the offer again. So this, this market now can be solved in a one shot. To summarize some of the benefits by using this last regression, uh, was there a question? Yeah, and just a quick question. I'm trying to capture his intuition, like what is the connection between the weights of regression beta and the valuation phi? Like, uh, I'm sure you will show it at some point, but just what's the intuition there? Like, oh, phi is just the value that the um, 
what what's out you mean you mean what is the loss yes, function uh, no uh, how are the weights of regression are affected by this valuation of uh, phi i how is it affected by this phi i? Well, because this value is set directly by this buyer. Yeah. Um, and that kind of represents their willingness to pay. For example, if um, I have uh, an original kind of loss function with my MSC, yeah. and if I um, can reduce that, and how much um, I would be willing to pay by reducing it by a certain fraction. Okay. All right, all right. I'm just uh, trying to think of uh, some uh, extreme cases when phi is set as too few, uh, too, too small value or too high value. Like, uh, wouldn't so, compromise like the purpose of the regression task? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, if, for example, if a phi value is set to be too small, then obviously the second term would, you know, mean a lot, and the lambda value would actually um, shrink the the beta value even more. Um, so you would very be, be very um, unlikely to choose any of the data from your seller to actually um, include in your, um, in, your, in, your regression, in your regression. And if the phi value is very large, then the, the sellers could think of the, you know, the, then the buyer would have a very high willingness to pay, then the seller can actually set their uh, lambda values to be really high without, you know, discouraging the buyer from paying. Mm -hmm. So they can get actually a higher payment, a payment in the second term. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so yes, yeah, so to summarize some of the um, benefits of having this lasso term directly as a payment, um, first of all, it guarantees the revenue requirements of the sellers. Secondly, it also ensures the individual rationality of the buyer, which um, is proved in um, this other paper, and it maximizes the buyer's overall gain from the data market. Um, and at the same time, because the seller doesn't have to reject the payment anymore, it avoids solving this combinatorial problem um, that can be very computational, uh, computationally intensive. So um, using this framework, we um, conducted some case studies. First, let's look at a synthetic case just to see how the regressions, different regression methods work. Uh, we used um, an, a vector autoregressive process to generate time series data uh, with time step of one hour for five different agents. And um, they all have different coefficients or correlations between their data and Figure one and figure two on this page shows the results or the regression results uh, considering P1 or player one as the buyer. And uh, let's first look at figure one. It shows the coefficient on the y-axis um, and it uses different uh, regression methods. Um, the orange bar shows the real coefficient um, that is synthetic um, in our case. And uh, by using different regression methods, you, you, you can see that um, they generate different coefficients. And the last regression uh, is able to shrink most of the, oh, one thing I forgot to mention. Um, in this case, we, we're, the real coefficient actually only lies in um, lag one. We're using three lags for each agent. Um, lag as in, you can say, um, for example, in wind forecasting um, for each agent, I'll give you three hours of data before your forecasting period. And, um, and we're assuming that only the previous hours data has relevance to my forecasting task, um, not the, the, the hour two and hour three. So uh, when in reality, it's only the first lag that has an influence on the forecast, um, the lasso regression is able to capture most of that. So as you can see, uh, it sets the coefficient for lag two and lag one or lag three um, as mostly zero for the other agents. Um, and it also captures the non-zero uh, value of the uh, first lag, even though it shrinks some of them, uh, which is a natural kind of property of lasso. 
And compared to the OLS regression, it just overfits the data. It, it's kind of all over the place. Um, and we also put up this um, self-regression, which is what is done with the, the buyer themselves. So if they only use their own data to do the regression, obviously there will be some overfitting and they will not be able to capture all the um, variation in their, in their data. Um, and then if, you, if we look at figure two, um, the first two sub figures, is, they show OLS regression. One is with only the agent's own data and the other one is with the, everybody's data. And you can clearly see that uh, it's way overfitted with, uh, with everybody's data. And now if we use last regression um, by increasing the um, training period, um, you can slowly see that it captures the accurate uh, coefficients more and more. Um, and if we look at agent two, where we assume that agent two actually is an independent agent, meaning that their data has no correlation with, with other people's data whatsoever. And in this case, again, Lasso is able to capture most of that. So it kind of shrinks all the uh, coefficients for the other agents mostly to zero. Um, and um, th that also shows here, it kind of eventually boils down to the one uh, lag for the agent themselves. Um, one interesting, I forgot to mention previously on the previous slide is that the lasso or whatever, um, the lasso actually gives a much higher coefficient for the agent's own data. Um, and that reason being when you were doing the lasso regression, uh, if you remember previously when I talked about, talked about the lambda values for the agent, uh, central agent or the buyer themselves, they have to set the lambda value to zero. So there's no shrinkage applied to their own data, but there is shrinkage applied to other people's data. So, in, it, so there's a little bit of overfitting of their own data as well. Um, and if we're looking at the profit of each agent, as we increase the training time, you can see that for the sellers, um, the y-axis is the is the is a profit, and the x-axis is the is a training time. Um, for all the sellers, no matter who your buyer is, um, the first figure shows the buyer being P1, and the second figure showing the best buyer being P2. No matter who your buyer is, the the average uh, profit for each seller eventually shrinks to zero. So, Lian, we have a question from the audience. Oh yes. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Okay, hi, Lian. Uh, hi. I want to ask. Uh, sometimes in the in the regression setting, when we have like a a non-linear relationship, some feature data might need to mm -hmm. be transformed to include also quadratic or cubic terms. So for example, one seller might give one feature which might require to be transformed into essentially three features. Does he get additional revenue in that case? You're saying if, if there is a, there's non-linear um, correlations between the data. Data sets. Yeah, but between some uh, feature data that the seller uh, provides and the mm -hmm. target of the regression. For example, uh, uh, a classic case is uh, the, the electricity load with the temperature. So they have a quadratic mm -hmm. case. So you mm -hmm. need to include also the, the quadratic term. So the same yeah. feature would be included twice in, uh, yeah. let's say, in the, in the regression setting. So does the... I don't know, does the seller get additional revenue in that case or it's only considered, uh, I don't know, because the feature is the same, it's just transformed into a different, uh, it's just a transformation. Yeah, obviously because the loss function or, or, um, or the regression method is set um, originally by the seller, uh, sorry, by the buyer, and the, the central market operator could actually refer to that to see how they're doing the re regression, uh, adjust the regression or the first term of the regression accordingly, right? So if it's 
if they actually have a um, quadratic term or a quadratic uh, coefficient, then the, the market operator could also include that in, in the regression. Um, okay, so the, the, the buyer, uh, for example, might request it beforehand, so the, the, the market operator knows about it. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank yeah. you. No problem. Um, so yeah, going back to this figure, which shows the um, profit of each agent, um, for all the sellers, their profit eventually shrinks to zero as you increase the training time. And the reason being um, their profit, if you remember, it's in the form of the L1 norm of the product of the lambda value they set, which is the reservation to sell and the beta value, which is the coefficient of their feature um, um, fitted towards the, the target. And that does not have the time T in there. So when the market operator has figured out the, the correlation between the data sets, then no matter how much you increase the time frame, your, um, your profit will be fixed. So by increasing the time frame, you, um, if you do the, a per time step calculation of your profit, your profit would approach zero eventually. So, which is why in a data market setting, you have to think about what kind of training uh, period you wanna use to make it reasonable for um, the sellers. And for the buyers, um, remember for P2, because they have independent data, their data actually is not correlated with, with the other people. At first they get some profit, um, mostly because of overfitting, um, and eventually their profit gets to shrink, shrink to zero because the market operator is gonna figure out that actually their data is not, not correlated with any of the, the other sellers. But for player one where data actually is correlated with other people, um, they do get a little bit of a benefit and eventually it's gonna um, flatten out. And then we looked at some uh, real data. We used uh, data from North Pool, which is the, market operator, energy market operator for Nordic and uh, Baltic countries. And we pulled out some zonal data for Denmark and Sweden uh, uh, on wind generation. And here we assume that this phi value, which is the willingness to pay from the buyer side to be zero, uh, to be one. Um, and we vary the seller's reservation to sell. Sorry, here it's not you, it's actually Lambda. And, um, to um, uniformly. So we set all the reservation to sell uh, to be the same and vary them uniformly. And then on the Y axis, it's the average profit of each seller. And as you can see, the, the profit increases a little bit and then they peak and then they eventually go down. Um, and this is due to the fact that with a payment term, which is the product or the L1 norm of the product of lambda and beta, um, when you increase the lambda value, oh, of course, when lambda is zero, then the profit is gonna be zero. When you increase the lambda value, it also increases the shrinkage of the beta value. So there's a trade-off between the two terms and which, are, which gives this shape. And they have different shapes for different um, agents, and that's mostly due to the fact that the, they have di different correlations of their data and also uh, the magnitudes of the data uh, um, is also a factor. And now if we fix all the other agents data and we just vary two specific sellers uh, reservation to sell um, and then look at their profit using this heat map, you can see, so SE stands for Sweden zone. Uh, so one is a Sweden zone one and SE two is Sweden zone two. And uh, we're assuming that the Denmark zone one is the bu data buyer here. And um, you can see that um, each agent's, each seller's profit not only is affected by their own reservation to sell, it's also affected by other people's reservation to sell. Actually, this is an interesting topic because um, if you also attended Professor Merriam 
Tamgar uh, Poor's uh, uh, lecture from two weeks ago, she talked about learning of different agents and how they can find the best response to a certain um, strategic um, setup. And here you can also see that um, when an agent uh, proposes a reservation to sell, they don't know what other people have proposed. And they also don't know, um, they, what they only receive is the market outcome. So how they can learn through this uh, partial information um, uh, setup, um, their best reservation to sell to, to propose to the market um, can maybe um, solvable using um, uh, Professor um, Kamarapur's uh, method. So, and that is the case studies. Um, and to conclude this talk, we have learned that with the data market under regression framework, it encourages data exchange um, by compensating the data sellers for their data. And also to use lasso term as directly the payment in the data, mar data market uh, can not only guarantee the data sellers uh, revenue requirements and it can also maximize the overall gain of the data buyer. Some ongoing research um, includes the out of sample analyses and we're also looking into uh, whether we can set bounds on the profit deviation uh, in the out of, out of sample scenarios. And um, we're also investigating other regression methods um, to be included in the data market. And um, hopefully we can also extend the usage of this um, data market to other applications outside of the uh, energy markets. And with that, um, that concludes my presentation and uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope that wasn't too fast and uh, any question is uh, welcome. Uh, thank you, thank you, Lian. So let's uh, open Q and A session, and we already have the first question from Priyanka. So feel Great. free to unmute yourself. Uh, yes. So uh, thanks, Lian, for the talk. I think it was very interesting, uh, and also it's a it's a new topic uh, for I think uh, most of us who are dealing with electricity markets. So here we're talking about data markets. So I think that uh, makes it. Uh, very interesting also like the way you look at uh, this whole topic itself and this idea so I think it's very relevant in, in these times of more renewable energy and so on so I had some uh, some doubts you know some small clarifications uh, for yeah. example when you talk about like the case studies so here in uh, you're talking about some like this SE3 and yeah so on so here for you quantifying these profits for uh, which markets was it like real-time market so how much profit do you gain from uh, trading data in those markets and what was the time frame that you uh, considered for trading? Right, so um, the general setup here we're using is still based on uh, the loss function that the buyer proposes. And we have assumed um, this um, loss function that is a function of the um, mean square errors. Um, so it's not, related to a specific market that they, it's actually a very interesting question because you can actually see if you can incorporate the direct kind of imbalance cost as a loss function in the in your um, objective function and use that as direct um, kind of the, uh, the loss function for the, from the buyer's perspective. But we haven't done that. Um, this is just uh, the direct inclusion of the MSC as the loss function times the, um, willingness to buy from the buyer, which we set as one. Mm -hmm. And then do you buy it in like real time? Let's say, uh, do I, if I'm a trader, I'm trading right mm -hmm. now and mm -hmm. I'm trading for the uh, real time market and then do I buy it in real time or uh, when do I buy this data? You can because have that's... a rolling. Yeah, okay. you can have, you can have a very short Kind of time mm -hmm. frame. I'm just going to buy for the next hour, for example, here, um, and then of course you would have to do some. Um, not of course, but you can do some sort of um, uh, what do you call it? Recourse payment once the next time step is revealed. Mm -hmm. That's why uh, we need to look at look into the out of sample mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, analysis. But currently, we're just assuming that all the payments are settled within sample. 
So you look at the historical data and see how that fits, and then you decide what the payment should be. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But then you can you can look at it in in a rolling window. I'm gonna trade for the next hour and then use mm -hmm. all the data I have up till now. Um, mm -hmm. For me okay. and for all the other sellers as well. All right. Yeah. Okay. That uh, that clarifies uh, uh, some things now. Okay. And, and and in general, the approach that I saw here that you were taking, uh, I think it was more. Uh, in terms of like the quality of data, right? That's why mm -hmm. you're talking about payments. So in general, when we talk about electricity markets, so there we can talk about how much volume is traded, volume of energy that's traded and at what price. But here mm -hmm. I saw that your approach was more about, uh, let's say the payments. And I think that was because you did not think about the quantity of data traded, but more like the quality of data that's being traded, right? Yeah, I think it's more about the relevance of the data. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you offer as a seller, you offer some data as completely irrelevant to the buyer's analytics task. Um, what this market framework is going to do is that it's going to pick up on that and it's, it's going to realize and your market is useless and we're just gonna, not going to offer you any payment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think uh, that, that it's also a very important question. Uh, here to answer like uh, to discuss about when talk about data markets so yeah that mm -hmm. that's very nice approach okay yes i think uh, hmm, that that clarifies uh, my questions thank yeah, you thanks for the questions thank you Priyanka. Uh, also uh, feel free to drop uh, your questions into chat or unmute yourself so let me just step in quickly with my own question it also related to what akulas was asking about specification of regression, right? Who mm -hmm. uh, gets to specify the form of regression? Is it linear, is it polynomial? Like some also accounting for this feature transformation Oops. to wow. the saying. And what are the strategic incentives in specification the, the regression? Can you get the data cheaper if you go, I don't know, for polynomial uh, regression rather than for linear? Like, do you like feel, uh, do you have this intuition? Um. Okay, I'm uh, gonna try to remember what you, the, the few questions you had. Uh, first of all, who gets to choose uh, what regression to be used? Um, so let's go back all the way. So in this framework, uh, first the buyer broadcasts their own regression and their own loss function, right? And then they do their own regression um, based on how they evaluate the losses. Um, so they get to choose the original uh, regression framework for themselves. And then when it gets to the central data market, they know how the buyer did their own regression, but at the same time, they don't have to choose the same regression as the buyer. Okay. So they do have the freedom to choose their, which is why in this case, we have asked the central data market operator to choose a lasso regression so that they, they include the revenue threshold from the seller's perspective. All right. And, um, and you said something about- um, Strategic incentives, like uh, to specify the regression, when the buyer submits a regression to a data market, right? Mm -hmm. So um, is there any incentives to, you know, um, to, to change the regression form, like from linear to polynomial? In, uh, in expectation mm. to receive the same data set for 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 cheaper price. Um, yeah, so eventually the data market is going to try to maximize the gain for the buyer, right? So they can actually try a bunch of different regression methods and see which one would help them maximize the gain for the buyer. And remember, the gain is a combination of uh, the the buyer's own loss function, also the payments. So the, the cent, what the center market operator, a central market operator has to do is that they, they may need to make sure that they incorporate all of the revenue thresholds from the seller's perspective and also while looking at the loss function that has been defined mm -hmm. by the buyer. And they can try a bunch of different regression methods and see which one fits best. This answers the questions. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, I think then we are good. So we don't, I don't see any more questions. So unless you interrupt me right in this moment.
So, uh, I think we can, oh, there is a hand. Yes, cool. I could ask, please go ahead. Yeah, just barely made it. Uh, Leanne, I think you, you mentioned it that uh, uh, something about the solving a, a combinatorial problem here. Mm -hmm. uh, so one way to, to view Lasso is like a, a, heuri a heuristic method for the best feature selection. So in principle, you could, you could do a mixed integer problem to find the best feature. I mean, not for this specific case, but do you see in the future like uh, this type of market, but instead of having a Lasso regression, having a, let's say, a, an optimal regression that optimally finds the best features and uh, gives, let's say, the, some sort of optimality to the, to the revenue that the buyers, uh, the sellers receive. So effectively, the, the, the loss would, be, would include a, a mixed integer uh, problem in that case. Yeah, so I think that's kind of two questions. First, whether you would include, how do you like solve this combinatorial problem? Um, you, the problem here is not really, the combinatorial problem doesn't lie in the lasso. It lies with the seller not, uh, wa not wanting to accept the offer. Um, and when a seller not, doesn't want to accept a certain offer, they would retract their data. And by retract, retracting their data, the whole regression framework would change and the values that would be associated, uh, allocated to the sellers would also change. That's why it, has be, it will become a combinatorial problem. It's not just, oh, now like if this seller doesn't like uh, their payment, they leave and then we do the regression again. Um, and if some, some other seller uh, likes to leave as well, uh, it doesn't mean that the previous seller cannot come back because it, it, it's possible that the previous seller that has left can actually come back and make, make this work. Um, so that is where the combinatorial problem comes in. But uh, with a lasso, the benefit is that it directly includes the revenue threshold in their regression. And you don't have to do this combinatorial um, analysis anymore. And the reason why we chose the lasso is because we have assumed that the revenue threshold set by the seller is the, the L1 norm of um, you know, the, the product of the, the lambda value, which is their reservation to sell and the coefficient. But if they set their um, revenue threshold differently, then we, we might look into a different regression method that doesn't have to be lasso. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. Thanks. Yeah. All right, I think we managed to finish it in uh, time. So uh, thank you everyone for joining. Just, um, and thank you again for Leanne for delivering this amazing talk. Uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, to remind you that our next talk is gonna happen on very unusual schedule next Monday. So in a few days, uh, feel free to join to listen in to uh, Victor Zavala talking about economics of data centers and energy markets. Right. Okay, thank you everyone who makes it to, to our session today. Thank so, you everyone for participating and thank you for the invitation again, Vladimir. Great, great. Thank you all. <laughs>